Our speaker today is Cal Wilhoit, and he's going to be talking to us about part two of the research that he's been doing with SCADA and control systems gear. So uh, we'll give everybody a few more minutes to come in. Uh, just um, I'd like to remind everybody on the way out, try to RFID out, to, and you'll get a survey. Uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Can, is the mic on? Okay. Okay. Oh, he's going to have a lapel mic. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, Kyle. Okay. Thanks. Yep, thanks, Chris. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Kyle Wilhoit. Um, what I'm going to be discussing today is looking into who actually attacks SCADA and ICS devices. This is part two of some research that I've been conducting since November and December of last year. And I presented the first half of this in Black Hat EU uh, earlier this year. The difference is, if you weren't in that, you're still going to get all the same data, but additional data as well. So this is actually going a much deeper into the architecture, into what I did, the attack methodologies, et cetera, and how I attributed the data to the attackers that were going after these honeypots. So this is more in depth. Uh, it is the second part, but keep in mind, you don't necessarily have to know about the first uh, presentation to Black Hat EU to really get the, the value from this. So a quick who am I? Um, again, I'm a threat researcher at Trend Micro. Uh, do research and blogging on criminal underground, uh, targeted uh, malware, malware-based espionage, exploits, vulnerabilities, all the traditional security stuff that everybody hears about. Uh, look into malware reversing, detection, uh, and again, ICS and SCADA security, obviously, that's why we're all here. Um, offensive exploitation, uh, those types of things. So what's the presentation going to focus on? Um, I think a lot of you probably know, but nonetheless, uh, we're going to talk about, first of all, kind of an overview and concerns with ICS. That's for those of you that may not necessarily be in the ICS arena, uh, but this is going to help kind of those individuals get introduced into the concepts and introduced into some of the uh, basic concepts of ICS and SCADA. Also, we're going to look at who's attacking ICS devices, as well as the targeted attackers, looking into their methodologies, looking into some of the things that actually came up against uh, the devices. So what are ICS devices? I know a lot of you already know this, but still need to cover that. They're used in virtually anything where production is created. So it's used in automobile manufacturing, energy, gas, water. Virtually anything uh, that is produced uses ICS or SCADA in some fashion or another. They're notoriously insecure, as a lot of you have probably heard. A lot of the uh, Shodan publication and all that stuff has come out. So it's notoriously insecure. Uh, the software is sometimes embedded, sometimes not. Uh, proprietary operating systems, all these things kind of revolve around the ICS arena. And again, it's typically proprietary. So the operating systems, et cetera, are typically proprietary to that manufacturer, to that device. It's going to be helpful to look at a glossary as well. I'm not going to go through all these terms, um, but it's good to know whenever I start to use some of these throughout the presentation what they are. Um, so human-machine interface is of particular importance uh, in a little bit, as well as RTU, SCADA, Historian, and then the two uh, protocols on the bottom, Modbus and DNP3. So again, I'm not going to go through each of these, but by the end of it, you'll understand what each of these do and how they work in conjunction with the honeypot. What does a typical ICS deployment look like? It's fairly linear and fairly uh, common. So a lot of you are familiar with this type of a network layout. The only difference is you're going to notice a few things. First of all, there's really no security implementations, right? You're not seeing a firewall. You're not seeing any type of um, ACLs necessarily. You're not seeing any type of um, stateful packet filtering in any fashion, realistically. The reason I did this isn't because I forgot. It's because that's really truly reflective of an ICS environment. So keep that in mind as we start to step through some of the items that I'm going to be presenting today. Um, as you can see, the historian traditionally sits out in the DMZ, or traditionally what is known as the DMZ, uh, control center, and then substations that sit off with RTUs communicating up uh, through the chain. Look quickly at two different protocols. As you saw on the glossary page, there's Modbus and DNP3. First of all, Modbus. This is the oldest ICS protocol, um, and it controls I.O. interfaces for the most part. That's just broad categorization, but for the most part, it does um, control I.O. interfaces. There's no authentication or encryption, no surprise there. Um, no broadcast suppression, 
and there are known vulnerabilities published. It's also a very, very simple protocol. As you can see, there's virtually nothing to it. Uh, it's plain text um, and very simple. So you can start to see that that starts to introduce a lot of security issues and a lot of concern around that protocol. Now into DNP3. This is a little bit more complex. This is also very common. Um, there's an authentication and encryption again. There are versions of DNP3, obviously, that do incorporate um, security methodologies, so authentication, encryption, et cetera. But by default, DNP3 does not support encryption or authentication. There are also several published vulnerabilities. And as you can see, it's a little bit more complex as well, um, a little bit more complex than Modbus. So what are some big threats to uh, industrial control systems? This isn't all of them, so don't, you know, don't uh, automatically quote me as saying these are the only three issues. That's definitely not the case. HMI um, is the human machine interface. Uh, it allows arbitrary command executions if you were to compromise the HMI, as well as doing set point modifications. So if you're looking at compromising or an HMI environment gets compromised, this is a common way to go out and actually exploit systems um, that are uh, sitting behind the HMI. And we're going to get into attacker methodology a little bit later. The data historian, uh, going after and looking at the threat to a data historian, it allows inbound traffic to a secure network segment. So if you remember the first diagram, the historian sits in the DMZ and it acts as a bastion host in between the DMZ and the control network as well as the business LAN. So from there, you can access the internal network and or the control system network. So compromising the data historian could give you privileged access into the control system network. And then the RTU, the remote terminal unit, allows remote communication ability. Again, that's very similar to the way that the historian could be compromised. So it allows for uh, remote arbitrary command executions um, and, and a remote communication ability. I oftentimes find it uh, beneficial to look at the differences as well between an industrial control system uh, security individual's job as well as an IT security uh, job. From an ICS perspective, uh, you, go, you all are familiar with the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Well, the ICS environment has a little bit different perspective. The first thing needs to be integrity, right? So you need to make sure that the correct commands are issued. If you're looking into an ICS environment, you have to understand that their primary focus or an ICS environment's primary focus is to continue operation. It's about money at that point. It's not necessarily about security. The second piece would be limiting interruptions. That's availability, right? So it's a little bit backwards from the traditional CIA triad. And then third is protect the data, confidentiality, right? From the IT side, it's pretty obvious. Protecting the data, correct commands are issued, and then limiting the interruptions for availability. So it's a little bit backwards, but it's important to understand from an ICS standpoint what that mentality is. It's much different from a traditional IT security practitioner standpoint. So if we want to talk about pure numbers, uh, the first half of 2013, this was released uh, about a month ago, there's been over 200 confirmed um, incidents. And if you look at the actual pie chart breakdown, the, ener the energy sector accounts for 53% of those incidents. That's an interesting statistic as we start to go forward and look into some of these vulnerabilities and what's going on in these. As we all heard, SCADA is internet facing, nothing new there, right? Everybody's heard this, everybody understands that this is happening. Uh, some of the common places uh, that you're going to see SCADA being produced and pushed out to the internet are listed here. So using Google is a pretty common one. Um, I use some Google Foo to pull up some metering information. That metering information is actually from San Francisco. So I mean it's very easy to start to pull data from internet facing SCADA devices that are traditionally insecure. Um, Shodan, as everybody's heard, uh, ERIP, Pastebin, and Twitter. The reason I list these is because these are the methodologies that I was using uh, propagating out my systems and getting them advertised to the world. So now that we've kind of looked at ICS, SCADA, IT security, all those wonderful buzzwords in general, now I'm going to talk about a story. So there was a water pump controlling pressure and availability. Um, this happened in a total of eight countries, population of roughly 50 million. Uh, multiple cities across each of these countries. So there's multiple cities in each of these cities, or multiple cities in each of these countries across the globe. They're all internet facing. Uh, there's no security measures in place to speak of whatsoever. Um, so this is the actual control units. These, this is everything that you can see. Uh, Modbus, everything. These are modified commands. They were attacked several times over a period of months. The attackers gained access. They exfiltrated data. And this data wasn't made public necessarily. Um, this is not a story, actually. It happened, but the only difference is it happened in my basement. 
It also happened across the globe in a virtualized environment that I deployed to those eight countries. Um, we're going to step in now to look at the actual honeypots that I developed from a virtualized standpoint. This differs from the Black Hat EU talk that I did because I took the actual physical ICS device that I created or ICS honeypot I made in my basement, I virtualized it, and then I deployed it worldwide on virtual instances across the globe. So in total, there were 12 total honeypots in eight different countries, as I mentioned. Um, China, Japan, Singapore, uh, Australia, Brazil, the US, um, and one other that I, I don't remember the, other, the eighth one right now. Um, it's been running since January 2013. This environment has been. It's a combination of NIC systems, Windows, and embedded system OSs as well. So I'm using a combination of all of these items, as well as open source SCADA devices or, and open source uh, HMIs, et cetera. So I'm using a lot of open source tools as well. What does, the, what does the attacker see? If they go out and they start to probe around and start to look, what do they see? It's fairly simplistic, right? From an internet's perspective, they go out and they see the external IP that's mimicking a control system, or otherwise known as, at that point, the HMI, human machine interface. And then behind that would set the PLC. The way that the attackers would find these honeypots is probably a pretty common question that I've been getting. I've also been going out and I've been using uh, Shodan, so a lot of times I'm seeing actual referrers come through and hit the IPs and hit the honeypots via Shodan. In, additional, um, in addition, we've actually, I've deployed it out um, on Pastebin as well. That's a pretty common propagation platform to be able to deploy out and put SCADA IPs. This is a water control, et cetera, et cetera. So I used uh, Pastebin as well. That's fairly common. So what else do the attackers see? This is just a quick video of one of the particular honeypots. This was a testing honeypot that we developed. As you can start to go through, keep in mind that this is all insecure. This is a common type of ICS device that you're going to find on the internet. Again, keep in mind that whenever we were out and I showed you the actual Google uh, search that I had done, this is a very similar mock-up to what would happen if you go into those metering devices. I didn't obviously go in and modify anything, but I did go in and access. At this point, if you enter in um, an actual uh, standard default password, log in, this is the HMI, you can go in, and this is where you can start to do system commands, shut down, all these different items. It's very simple for them to get in. And it's very simple to go out and actually start to Google what default username and credentials are for these systems. Unfortunately, this isn't necessarily, um, this isn't new. This isn't something that, you know, oh, well, Kyle, you've deployed these systems, but you left everything default. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a majority of the world right now is doing this type of thing. So this isn't just, um, you know, rare. So this is the new architecture. Um, the idea behind showing you the actual entire architecture is twofold. In the Black Hat EU talk, legally, I couldn't at that point, primarily because of the actual beef module up top. For those of you that are familiar with beef, we're going to go into detail um, into that here shortly. Legally, the lawyers at Trend Micro didn't really, uh, didn't really like me talking about um, essentially exploiting the attackers, but we'll get into that. So I might actually not have a job at the end of this talk. I don't know. <laughs> um, so if anybody's hiring, let me know afterwards. <laughs> um, so as you can see, there's a home page system, and that dumps off to several other pages. So I have a Python script that I had created to mimic Modbus, and from that, the attackers could actually start to sniff traffic, look at the Modbus commands themselves. It's all clear text, et cetera, so fairly standard there. Um, once the attacker actually gained access to the actual HMI, so on the far right, the SCADA HMI, that's whenever I would run a beef module or a beef inject and actually inject uh, the attacker, and that's how I would attribute uh, who the attackers were. We're going to go into depth on that um, shortly. And then based on that, there's a lot of other HTML um, as well as ASP pages that are chunked off of that to make it more realistic, pumping pressure, uh, a lot of graphics. So if you make a modification to a set point, it will automatically modify a graphic, et cetera. So those types of things. Some of the tools that I used. Um, SCADA BR, that was a really great uh, open source HMI. I actually used that and modified some things on that. And that's what gave me the good HMI on the backside of the system to be able to issue and accept commands, modify set points, do all these things. Um, Beef, obviously, I used as well. Um, also used uh, OpenDNP3, which really helped out a lot whenever I was interfacing and creating a physical device. Um, I created some physical devices to deploy worldwide, et cetera. So I used that pretty heavily, as well as Snort and a couple other open source tools as well. 
to be, to be able to monitor what the attackers were doing. So we're actually going to go into some of that as well. What were the vulnerabilities that I presented? Uh, these are fairly standard. Again, these are not new. These aren't anything that would be out of the ordinary on a traditional ICS slash SCADA system. SNMP vulnerabilities, so rewrite SNMP standard stuff there. Uh, packet sniffing, IP spoofing, all the traditional types of attacks you'd see. Uh, specific ICS vul vendor vulnerabilities. The first iteration or the physical uh, device, I actually deployed uh, Siemens Somatic S7200 and that's what I was using to actually mimic these devices as well. I virtualized it after that because um, I was running out of budget and those devices you have to buy on eBay and it's just, it's a big pain. So that's why I virtualized it, to be able to deploy it worldwide and I don't have to really leave my basement. Um, HMI server vulnerabilities, uh, SCADA BR is great, but there are also some vulnerabilities with that software. So there are obviously some vulnerabilities there um, that aren't necessarily published, but they are there. Someone that has some uh, web app pen testing skills would be able to easily go out, uh, gain access, compromise that system. Authentication limitations, so that's pretty obvious as we saw in that demo. Just default username and password credentials, nothing new there, pretty standard. Limits of Modbus and DNP3 authentication encryption. Again, that's going back to the fact that these are in plain text. This is not encrypted, not authenticated. VXWorks vulnerability, and specifically for this, I was utilizing VXWorks for the FTP side. So I was utilizing a vulnerability in FTP that's easily uh, attained, that information is easily gotten uh, from the internet just by going out and Googling it. And then open access for certain ICS modifications, for fan speed, temperature, utilization of the ICS, et cetera. There were several instances that I left open pages, and I also tested instances that I left ICS slash SCADA pages open uh, and waited for those particular individuals to come in and see if they would modify those pages without even having to log into anything. Um, we'll get into the attack statistics soon. So the next logical question would be, what is an attack, right? So I considered attacks only things that were targeted, first of all. And by targeted, I don't mean state-sponsored. I don't mean uh, malware-based espionage. I don't mean those types of things. I mean targeted as in I was watching individuals perform reconnaissance on the devices um, and then going into not only footprinting but fingerprinting and doing all the traditional life cycle of attackers. That's what I considered an attack. I didn't consider automated scan attacks, et cetera, because that's really a waste of everyone's time, including my own. So I didn't include those. Um, only attempted modifications of the pumping system also. So anything that would compromise the operation of those particular honeypots is something that we were considering attacks as well. So anything that would be FTP, Telnet, Modbus, set point modifications, anything on that control system that could compromise the operation, I consider an attack. And, and only attempted modification via Modbus and DNP3. So if I was seeing protocol manipulation of any sort, I considered that an attack. Because that, at that point, shows that the attacker was gaining an understanding of the protocols and was going out and leveraging his skill set to be able to attack that honeypot. And then DOS and DDoS attacks will be considered depending on circumstances. Nothing of that sort ever happened, so um, that didn't come into play. But I wanted to consider that because DOS and DDoS in ICS SCADA environments can bring an entire system to its knees in virtually seconds. So I had to consider that as an attack depending on the circumstances. Um, again, there wasn't anything in that realm that was attacked, so keep that in mind. So what was the attack statistics? Um, 74 total attacks across the globe that we were seeing. Um, a large majority, as you can see, uh, is from Russia, 58.1%. And again, I didn't just attribute this to IP. So for those of you that are like, oh, well, how does he know it's Russia? We're going to get into that. And I'll probably be without a job. <laughs> um, so from a non-critical attack profile, right, non-critical attacks are a bit different. And whenever I say non-critical attack, what I'm referring to is an attack that could compromise the future of the actual ICS device, uh, the future operation of that device, meaning that if, if they could gain access to the system, uh, they could be persistent in that system, but they may not have dr dropped that device at that time, or they may not have been exfiltrating data for that time, they may not be doing certain things. So they might just be resonant on the system, but not doing anything. And that's what I considered non-critical, quote unquote. There were 63 of those, and again, uh, Russia at 67.2% kind of weighed in at first, and then you can start to see the breakdown. Um, after that. There wasn't a whole lot, but there were some interesting countries that showed up, uh, Palestine being one. The interesting thing about Palestine actually is that I was monitoring an attack from the original honeypot that I deployed in my basement, and then I watched the same exact 
machine name. I could I tied it back to the actual host name, not the same IP, but in the same slash 24 network that actually was then attacking honeypots elsewhere in the world. So it was interesting to be able to watch they were not only looking into those specific type of vulnerabilities and ICS vulnerabilities, I could watch them hit different honeypots across the planet. So that was an interesting statistic that I was monitoring um, from a couple different uh, actors in Palestine was, was one of those. So now from a critical attack standpoint, there was 11 uh, with China actually weighing in at one and we're going to get into the Chinese uh, attacks uh, shortly. Um, but that, that's the primary grouping of uh, the critical attack. And again, Palestine was the uh, interesting one as well as in China. So I said that I wasn't really tracking automated attacks, but I was keeping statistics for those attacks. Primarily because I want to understand just kind of what traffic you're seeing, um, what you're looking at, et cetera. So in all, over five months, there was roughly 32,000 automated attacks. That doesn't seem like a lot, especially for external facing ICS devices with IPs. And to be honest, I can't necessarily say why there wasn't more. I can just say that that's the number that, that I pulled. Um, there was over 1,200 unique IPs that performed a majority of these attacks. There were obviously one-offs that had performed a single scan, port scans, those types of things. I didn't count port scans into this. Otherwise it'd be, I don't even know how many, probably in the hundreds of thousands of millions. Um, but 1,200 unique IPs that performed those 32,000 attacks. So you can start to see pretty quickly that, I mean, a lot of those are going to be using automated, uh, you know, SQL injectors, et cetera. So keep that in mind that this isn't necessarily, you know, they, they might just be hitting these IPs with automated stuff and just let it go. So, so what are some of the attacks that we saw? So there was a data exfiltration attempt, which we're going to get in depth on. Uh, that, that was an interesting one, and that was definitely targeted in nature. There was modification to CPU fan speed. There's Modbus traffic modification, which again ties back to the targeted attacker standpoint, right? If I'm seeing Modbus traffic modification, I'm knowing at that point that these particular individuals are motivated to look into either destroying this device or attacking it in some fashion. It could be uh, malware based espionage, it could be statistical analysis, it could be whatever the case is, but that's what they're trying to do. HMI access uh, was very high, primarily again because it's default username and credential pass. Not, nothing new there. Modifying the pump pressure and modifying the temperature output. Those were interesting ones. Uh, those were direct compromises of the water system. Meaning that from the modified temperature output, I actually saw an attacker go in and modify the water temperature to be 125. They set the set point at 125. So at that point, the individuals on the receiving end would have a bit of a problem receiving water. And the same thing for the actual pump pressure. I was watching individuals go down and lower the pump pressure to where it would at that point not be able to pump water to homes and businesses, et cetera. And then shutting down the pump system as well. So that was complete, just shut down the pump system, I want to drop it, be done with it. So from a snort standpoint, what did I see? So I used a couple different combinations. I used digital bonds, quick draw, SCADA snort rules. And that was a good base tool set to be able to go out and deploy onto these systems to be able to understand what I was seeing. I also made some custom snort rules to be able to accompany and, and, and look into other attack vectors that were coming in and other types of traffic that was coming in. So keep that in mind. Uh, some of the ones that triggered, I'm not going to go through all of these, but the interesting ones are obviously the actual Modbus ones and DMP3. I mean, all these are protocol related. So again, these are targeted style of attacks. These are individuals that are going out and really looking into this type of stuff. Um, so that was interesting. So this is where things get a little bit interest, a little bit more interesting. Um, I referred to a couple of attacks that were critical in nature, um, originating from, from China. Um, Received an email on one of the honeypots. Uh, this particular honeypot, um, I had an email address on every single uh, actual web page, HMI as well as front page. From that email address, I was just hoping to see if anybody would email me. I wasn't even really expecting anything until one day I received an email. And this is the text of the email. Um, you know, obviously you can see it's riddled with some uh, grammatical errors as well as they refer, they're acting uh, like the city administrator for that city. So it was a bit interesting because if I was in a city and the city administrator emailed me this asking me to fill out a document, I would question that. I guess they were assuming that most city administrators and, and municipal water supplies wouldn't do that. So if you work for a municipal water supply or you do something uh, in that regard, don't respond to these emails and look for grammatical errors. I mean, it's pretty bad. <laughs> um, 
So if you open up the document that was attached, it's a decoy doc, just like traditional uh, targeted attacks that we've all seen and love. Um, this is the decoy doc. <laughs> Nothing there, right? So at this point, uh, started to reverse engineer some of the malware. This also comes up whenever you execute the doc or open up the document. The decoy dro doc drops. You close that out and this pops up. For those of you that are interested in open source intelligence, et cetera, that is tombkeeper at 126.com. So for those of you that want to go out and find out who this particular uh, individual is, have fun. That's a good one. Um, so at this point, you can also start to watch network traffic, et cetera. And you can also watch dump files, drop files, et cetera. Um, it drops two files. The first is gh.exe. That's just a pass, that's a hash dump. Nothing crazy there. And then AI shovels a, shump, uh, shovels a shell back to a dump server, and those are the switches um, that you can see. For those of you that are familiar with Mandiant's APT1 report, this is starting to make a little bit more sense now, and we're going to get into that. But for those of you that are familiar, you've seen this before. The malware is communicating to a drop CNC server in China. Um, it exploited the traditional CVE 2012-0158 uh, vulnerability in Microsoft Office. Pretty standard there. So nothing, uh, nothing crazy with that vulnerability, just standard. Uh, malware communicating to these two drop servers, or two CNC servers. These two were in the US. It was also communicating to two other um, IPs that uh, I can't disclose at this time because of the US government involvement, et cetera. But those two IPs have actually subsequently been taken down by the US government. So if you guys can go out and look at them, it, you're not going to find much. So execution. So upon the execution of that uh, document itself, the decoy drop doc dropped and then started to execute background commands, et cetera. I noticed there were files leaving that particular server after five days. So they waited for five days. They it executed. I watched traffic ping out, uh, reach out. I watched some files execute, and then it went quiet for five days. And I'm going to show a map of the attack profile towards the end of this so you can get a better visual of how this attack happened over days, times, et cetera. So overall what they exfilled uh, was a fake VPN config file. So I just dumped a fake VPN config file that I literally just typed into Microsoft. Uh, I think I did it in WordPad. Modified it to be an actual VPN config and dropped it and let them figure that out at that point. Uh, network statistics dump, SAM database dump, and then they gained uh, persistence just via the traditional process migration. So nothing too crazy there either. So the persistence, persistency mechanism is virtually the same as all targeted style attackers. Uh, they dumped the SAM database and they were looking for lateral movement, perceived lateral movement by dumping the network statistics, et cetera. Um, doesn't, op doesn't execute in Office 2010, so nothing crazy there. So if we look at the actual APT1 report, Again, for those of you that are familiar, uh, it's Comment Crew, that was their name. A lot of other groups have different names for them. Different threat intelligence agencies have different names. Um, it included many APT variants that we've all seen, love, know, et cetera. One of particular interest uh, to me, primarily because of this malware, was Hacksface. For those of you, you know, that haven't seen it, this is a clip of where Hacksface fits into the development life cycle and when Hacksface first came kind of into existence. Uh, it was first seen in 09, latter part um, of 08. So that's whenever it first comes across. This is commonly used in the energy sector, seen across the board uh, in the energy sector. This is the actual code um, of the malware itself. And you can see the, all of these, these four screenshots is the way that you can quickly attribute the data to Hacksface. So you can obviously see on the string dump to the left that it says the Hacksface at uh, hash, dollar sign, et cetera. That immediately from a targeted attack perspective tells me what that is. Um, and then everything else as you can see, these are all the essential indicators of compromise that I was utilizing to be able to go out and see what those attackers uh, used. So. so one step further, the connections that were actually seen, this is a listing of those. Um, for those of you that are interested, I have my contact details at the end. I can give you all the IOCs that I created for these. So if you want IOCs directly for Hacksface, feel free to reach out to me and, and I'll send them out to you. Um, that includes MD5s for all the files, et cetera. So I have all that and I'm happy to share that. I just didn't include it here because I don't want you guys to sit here and stare at a page of MD5s all day and try to write it down. <laughs> so from an attacker lifecycle, 
this is kind of where we start to look into the attribution framework, right? I start to look into the attribution framework a little bit differently because think about the attribution framework of an ICS attacker is a little bit different than a traditional uh, pen test or a traditional attacker in that realm. What I mean is they still perform a lot of the same steps, so you're, a lot of this isn't going to be necessarily new to you, but what they perform in those particular steps is a bit different. So if we look at the reconnaissance stage, at that point they're doing all the traditional type of reconnaissance, open source intelligence, Maltigo runs, Maltigo transforms, Google searches, all those traditional things, so nothing too new there. From the scanning section, they do CAM table scans and ICO, ICS protocol responses. They're trying to see and probe out to find out what these particular systems are running, what they're doing, how they're doing it. So that's the next step. And then enumerating is pretty simple on that as well. It's just man in the middling the actual ICS uh, protocols. So again, nothing too different there. The next stage is a bit different. And from the experience that I've had with the HoneyNet, they took one of, two, uh, one of two steps really at that point. The first was would they, do they want to disrupt the system, right? Do they want to take that system down? That would be denial of service, system shutdown, uh, system modification, whatever the case is, that would be the disruption. And then penetration is really kind of that targeted attack perspective. That's passive monitoring, lateral movement, and then progressing through that environment. So looking for other devices, looking to compromise other devices for whatever their purpose is. And then from the infection stage, that's, that's pretty common as well. Um, that's infecting ladder logic, so actually injecting it uh, into the systems themselves, altering the process inputs, um, alter process outputs, so you're processing and altering inputs and outputs to any of those ICS devices. Um, disabling the alarms, that's a pretty important one. I've actually seen that one happen as well, um, that I actually saw individuals go in and disable alarms. So if there was an issue with the device, it wouldn't actually alarm the ICS engineer. That was an interesting issue because that, I saw some attackers that would go in and actually compromise the system, modify an alarm, and then leave. So that was somewhat interesting and I actually started to probe into those attackers some. And then uh, finally, just again, system shut down, nothing too crazy there, it's kind of the same as disrupt. So now we're going to get into the stuff that could compromise my job. Um, from an attribution standpoint, I really looked at three things. The first was IP, right? Everybody, oh uh, yeah, IP attribution, that sucks. It's not, and I agree, it sucks. That's why I went to beef, and that's why I went to code analysis. From a code analysis standpoint, I was able obviously to go out and look at the particular decoy doc, look at all those items, and really contribute it back um, to that point as being kind of a targeted, um, state sponsored, quote unquote, um, attack. Beef, however, I was using on a different fashion. I have to say this legally um, that I utilized beef behind the actual HMI. So if we think about the architecture of the honeypot, the HMI is a secured area that had default username and password credentials. Once they authenticated past that device, at that point they're, they're kind of mine, right? So um, at that point I injected beef uh, into their browser and I was able to run several commands against the particular individuals. Keep in mind, Beef is a functionality and Beef is a framework that allows you to do everything from doing an internal host name lookup all the way to going out and um, putting a interpreter shell on their device and running persistence mechanisms. So keep in mind that this isn't, I didn't go that in depth because um, I had some discussions with law enforcement, et cetera, in the US and they had advised me not to do anything that far. So I didn't do that. But what I did do was I detected Tor. So there's a methodology within Beef that allows you to detect, detect if Tor is being utilized on that host. So that's nice, right? Because a lot of times people are saying, oh, well, what's going to happen? You know, the guys are probably using anonymizers, Tor, or whatever. Well, Beef will help you identify if it's not or if it's being utilized. You can get registry keys. Uh, these are the five things that I ran. Uh, get physical location. So that actually works in a couple different fashions. One of the methodologies is actually kind of triangulating based on physical Wi-Fi signal. So it actually uh, helps you uh, get a physical location of where that box is sitting. Get system information. That includes host name, um, internal IP, et cetera. Um, and then get internal IP is pretty obvious as well. So you can start to see some of the events on the bottom, and that's kind of uh, the authentication mechanisms, and you can start to see the events. That's in beef, you can track what the users are doing, where they're clicking, how they're doing it, when they're doing it, et cetera. It will also show you refers. 
So if the individual was coming from Shodan or if they were coming from somewhere else, I can see that in the refer whenever they actually hit the site. So you can start to attribute how the attackers are finding your, your items, right, your, your devices. You can start to attribute that. And you can start to see as well that you can get mouse clicks, you can get uh, virtually anything you want. If you run a script, I actually ran a script on this that when the attacker actually gained access, it would automatically inject them without any interaction from me. I don't like being up 24 hours a day monitoring these devices, so instead I just had it automatically inject. Again, legally, um, yeah, that's questionable, um, and I don't think I was supposed to really talk about this piece, but it is what it is. <coughs> so looking back at the targeted attack, I wanted to kind of break down what the days looked like, right? It's kind of a, a different architect. So the, attack, the attacker actually spent, sent the spearfished email. The attachment was actually opened on a salted doc server. I had an internal server that had the VPN config file, salted documents, et cetera. I executed the actual uh, document at that point because I wanted to watch exfiltration occur. I wanted to see if anything was going to happen. And to be honest, I didn't expect much to happen at all. Um, this was way beyond anything that I had expected to occur. So whenever I had to open the attachment, um, started to run obvious, you know, Wireshark captures, TCP dump, et cetera, and that's whenever I started to see that a back door was shoveled, and then process migration for persistency is step four. And then days five through 17, as I mentioned, this is whenever you're actually looking at when the attacker connected back in, and then the data exfiltration piece. Why there was a five day waiting period, I can't say at this point, I don't know. Um, but what I can say is they connected back into 2100 Central Standard Time, um, and then they started to do data exfiltration directly thereafter. They did that for a period of about 30 minutes, a little bit more, um, and then they were gone after that. Uh, they dumped out again what I said earlier, config files, et cetera, and then they were gone, didn't come back. So from an attacker profile perspective, um, this is kind of lumping everything together and looking into the actual attacks themselves, right? So most of the attacks to be are not, appeared to be non-targeted. That was, again, from the statistics earlier that I showed. Uh, the confirmed work, and I put comment crew in quotes because everybody has different names for that particular uh, group, um, on one occasion. Um, many attackers were opportunists. And whenever I say that, I mean I noticed a lot of individuals that would be just port scanning uh, slash 24, uh, an external network. They come across an interesting box that has port 502 listening, and at that point, they probably went out and Googled and said, well, what is port 502? Oh, it's Modbus. Oh, that's an ICS system. Oh, I've read a lot about that on dark reading. I've heard a lot of stuff about ICS boxes uh, being compromised all the time, so let's go out and start poking at it. Um, so I saw a lot of that where individuals were doing port scans um, and then they just come across and what I would think is that was the methodology. They'd find 502, go out and Google it, and start to go from there. And there was an uptick in crimeware. Whenever I say that, I'm referring to A, the attacks that were based in Russia, quote unquote, um, and then secondly, the amount of malware that was actually being dropped on the boxes from an automated standpoint. There was a lot of malware that I was watching dropped, and they weren't anything new. It's just a lot of the same type of uh, stuff that you all see, that you see every day. But there was an uptick in that, based on the fact that I had a worldwide perspective, not just in the United States anymore. So it was a bit different in that regard. A couple things that started uh, I started to ask myself was, why would the attackers go after a municipal water plant, right? I know a lot of you are probably like, well, this isn't, this isn't Shell Oil, this isn't Exxon Mobil where they can go out and get, you know, they can go out and get uh, secret formulas or mapping data for the middle of the ocean. Um, and I can't honestly accurately say why the attackers would want to do this. That's why I say that there's a lot of opportunists. The people that were going out, shutting down these systems and modifying things, that was to my, to my best bet. Um, what I would think to be just an opportunist that wanted to shut stuff down or some script kitty in his mom's basement that just wants to mess stuff up. Um, and that's kind of what I was thinking. But I also get the question, um, well, if these systems get dropped, right, in the way you say they do, they got shut down, they got water pressure changed, et cetera, does this happen in the real world, right? Does this actually go on? Does this happen? The interesting statistic about that is, or to think about it in a different way, I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, ICS engineers are a very smart group of individuals, but their primary focus is not on security. Their primary focus is on ensuring that those devices stay up. So if there was an actual security incident against an ICS device, if a device dropped, if a device changed water pressure, if something happened, set points got modified, 
their primary goal and, and objective is that at that point is to get the system operational. It's not to worry about doing investigation on was there a, an event, was there a security incident. Their primary, primary objective is to say, I don't give a damn about that and I want to get the device back online so I can continue to mine coal or I can continue to, to get water or do whatever. So I think that some of these things are occurring. With what consistency, et cetera, I obviously can't say. But what I can say is that they're, they're probably occurring, but in what way? I, I can't say. So finally for some recommendations. So my Black Hat EU talk, um, there were some recommendations that I made there and some of these are a bit different. So if you want a full list of recommendations, you can contact me and I'll send you the full list or go out and you can look at my Black Hat EU uh, slide deck and see the other recommendations as well. So it's a little bit different but a lot of the same stuff. Um, so the first is disable internet access to your trusted resources, right? I mean, a lot of this would be prevented if you disabled access to the trusted resources. A lot of these attacks in this talk I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't have access to the internet with those devices. Maintain trusted resources at the latest, tr at the latest patch levels. I think that's common, right? We hear that all the time. We say, oh yeah, always, you know, patch a server, do these things. It's, it's very, very important and, and more so in the ICS SCADA environment to keep your things patched because of 2012-0158, that CVE for instance. If I had my system patched up, if I was using a modern uh, Microsoft Office iteration, wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have dropped that. And then make sure you're diligent monitoring when those patches and fixed are released, right? Everybody says, okay, yeah, we're just going to deploy out uh, new patches when they come out, here's our life cycle, et cetera, but monitor those things, especially in the ICS world. I'm a big fan of two-factor authentication in whatever fashion or whatever uh, iteration you decide to choose. That's not what the talk is about. What the talk is about is just saying use two-factor authentication. It's not hard to implement. It can be costly, et cetera, but it's very important, especially on trusted resources, to utilize two-factor authentication at all, everywhere if you can. Control contact contractor access. I've actually seen a lot of compromises in ICS environments occur because of contractors. It's not the ICS engineer's fault. It's they, they have a contractor that comes in, they hook in their laptop to um, the ICS environment, they're going to do some updates on um, a Siemens device and then their box is compromised and guess what? Now you have malware running in the ICS environment that you can no longer control. So control contractor access at all costs. Um, you know, that's, that's very important. Use network segmentation. This is important as well, right? As we saw in the first diagram, ICS devices are traditionally segmented out from DMZ, et cetera. Ensure that you're utilizing that network segmentation meth methodology and also put in security constraints in between those environments. Have firewalls, have ACLs in place, have those items in place that don't allow certain traffic in between those zones. Utilize just traditional security methodology. It's not hard to just throw in some cheap firewalls. Don't allow ICS protocols across corporate networks, right? or other non-secured, non-controlled networks. Whenever I say don't allow ICS protocols, it kind of goes back to the segmentation piece, right? Go out, have the actual firewalls in place and use the rules that are in place. Deny those things. Just do it in any, any default deny. Just be done with it. <laughs> Implement a USB external media lockdown. This is a big thing as well. Um, I've seen a lot of USB infections happen um, in those control networks, again, because a contractor comes in and yeah, you don't allow them to plug their laptop into your network, but you'll allow them to have a USB drive. <laughs> okay, great. That USB drive has malware, they're going to plug it into your machine on the control network and then you're owned. So keep that in mind. Use proactive protection. There's a lot of communities and a lot of people that go out and they say, ah, oh, don't use IPS IDS in ICS environments because it has the opportunity to, to drop those devices, to break the boxes, et cetera. I, on the other hand, uh, think that you should take a proactive approach and start to look into utilizing those technologies. Use IDS. Don't proactively block necessarily, but use IDS to get a visualization into what's going on in that network. Whitelist applications. This is important as well. Have a standardized set of applications that you're going to be deploying in those environments and stick to that plan. Don't make modifications unless it's absolutely necessary to do. Classify data and assets. This is the biggest thing. I'm a big proponent on incident response and forensics in the ICS world. And if you don't have a classified data and assets standard, you're not going to be able to perform incident response or forensics in that environment. I can nearly guarantee you. Primarily because if you have a list of data or you have a list of, of, of machines rather and you know what the criticality of those machines are and you have that classified, you know how critical it is to go out and do incident response on those devices if something happens. So that's primarily for an incident response slash forensic uh, standpoint. 
follow a standard. I'm not a huge standard fan, but in this case it is good to, to follow some sort of a standard, whatever it is. If it's NIST, whatever the case is, use something. Uh, not necessarily as a, not PCI where you have to go down the checklist, but have it as a foundation, implement some of the protocol things there, et cetera. Use it as kind of a good foundation. Red team often. I know a lot of guys are getting heartburn out here hearing that piece, but I think it's important. You have to understand, you know, just like a normal corporate network, you have to red team and blue team. The same thing applies, in my opinion, in the ICS world. Have a lab, for instance. Take all the devices that you have, deploy them into a lab, and then do red teaming in that. And if you find a, if you find a vulnerability that you're exploiting, just fix it in the production environment. So have a lab set up for that if you need to. And then manage your vulnerabilities. That's kind of standard with the business environment as well. Just keep on top of your vulnerabilities, keep on track with what you're doing, and constantly stay on top of that. So with that, um, that's all I have. Uh, I have my email address, uh, my work email address, and my uh, Twitter name. Feel free, again, to reach out to me directly if you want any of the lists of indicators of compromise, MD5s, um, anything like that. Feel free to ask questions before, after, now, whenever you guys like. And uh, thank you. Sure, that's a good question. So the question was, if I wouldn't have opened up that, uh, that document, would it have, inf or would it have, would there have been other factors or other infection vectors into the environment? The short answer into the internal network is no. No, it wouldn't have. What the other vulnerabilities are, what would have been compromised is realistically the operation of those devices. So the only real targeted attack that revolved around um, espionage or targeted style of attack was utilizing that traditional CVE 2012-0158. However, the other attacks that were present, the other vulnerabilities, et cetera, I wasn't really seeing anything that would have really compromised the system on the inside. They were primarily bringing the box down, modifying set points, very simple stuff. And that's why a lot of those attacks, as I kind of mentioned, were opportunist uh, type of attacks. Because they weren't really like creating CVE 2012-0158 docs and sending them to me. They were very, they drive by, do a Google search for default username and passwords, log in, start breaking stuff. So, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, that's that's a great thing. So the question was, do you think that we should really spend our time focusing on red teaming activities as opposed to proactive protection, deployment of firewalls, et cetera? Correct. Oh. Okay. Sure. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That that's a great yeah that's a great point. So. I just recently spoke down in Texas at the SANS Digital Forensic Conference on ICS uh, incident response and forensics because I think that's just as important. Uh, from a utilization of resource standpoint, I mean, it, it obviously comes down to budgetary constraints, et cetera, but I think you're exactly right. Um, I probably should have included that, that blue teaming or incident response slash forensics really needs to be approached probably before the red teaming piece. I included that in the Black Hat Europe one. I probably should have put that here for context, but that's a great point. You really need to introduce incident response and forensics into ICS so you understand what attacks are happening in your environment. So that's a great point. Have you considered modifying your system to incorporate multiple data points to sort out the opportunists from the ones that truly understand the system, such as pressure before, pressure after, and a valve that says yep. open close? Because ICS engineers often dispute, saying, you can monkey with one of my data points, however, I've got two or three others to verify. To verify. Whether it's true or whether it's false or whether it's simply that's, that's a great question. And, and honestly, that is hopefully the third iteration that will either be at RSA or Black Hat EU of next year. Um, that's actually what I'm working on now. Uh, that's becoming a bit more of a challenge because it's, I, there's a lot more implementation. I mean, what I created wasn't 
it's complex, but from an ICS operator standpoint, a true ICS engineer would get in and be like, okay, yeah, you know, nothing, it wouldn't be anything too, um, too crazy, I guess you'd say. But from that standpoint, it's a lot of intense work, and that's what hopefully the third stage is, as well as rolling it into a more of a production environment. But that's a great point. Sure. Uh, yes. Um, My question is, Okay, good. Good. Yeah, so from, from my standpoint, I can say from two industries that I've been directly involved with. The first would be um, electricity generation. That's the first one I've been directly involved with. And the second would be coal mining as well. I know from the coal mining industry, um, it's, it's sad, it's atrocious, to be honest. There's virtually no control, and if there's any, anybody that's working for a coal company, I apologize. Um, if there's a security person at a coal company, I apologize. Um, and your company might be different. However, the ones that I've been exposed to have been very insecure and have been lacking ACLs, ACLs, have been lacking firewalls, have been lacking those it, it, things. Cheaper. Yep. Offense, right? Or not even that in some cases, yeah. Yeah, I, I can say I haven't seen any research in that area. Um, that sounds like a really good area for opportunity for doing research, primarily because, again, as you said, that's an area that is obviously very insecure. And I mean, it, I, I've been to several areas that have literally nothing. It's a box with an RT, with, with literally a field device there in a box. That's it. There's nothing. You could walk up to it if you just were walking somewhere, and you could come up to it and just pop the top off and have access. So I don't know. I haven't seen any research on that. Um, but, but that's a really good point. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask about protocol attacks. So you mentioned that mm -hmm. Bumble occurred, and it's a, a two-part question. One, is there any evidence that those protocol attacks were reliable simply because left the portal, or did they actually get in and then begin going out? That, that's a good, yeah. So to the first part, the question was, uh, was Modbus, for instance, was it externally facing and open, or did they have to gain access and, and, and compromise it? I tried it both ways, and it was successful both ways, meaning the first iteration that I had of the HoneyNet or HoneyPot had Modbus externally facing with no, packet, with no filtering in place whatsoever. So if you did a port scan, you'd see Modbus sitting there, right? So that was the first iteration. Then I changed it because I wanted to see, you know, obviously what effect it would have if I changed it. Obviously the number went down dramatically of the amount of man in the middle attacks, the amount of spoof, et cetera, but they were still being present by compromising the internal operations. So if they were able to compromise the actual HMI and it was just communicating in the background as well via Modbus, then they could also go there and also start to, to uh, do man in the middle at that point. But that was much less than obviously going out and seeing it on the external side. And that's why I had mentioned that a lot of it was opportunist. Because they'd drive by, they'd see 502 open, and they would see that it wasn't filtered. And they'd say, oh, well, that's interesting. And then they'd go out and start to do, you know, looking into that protocol and, and looking at attacking it. So it's a good question. All right. Well, thanks again. Feel free to reach out to me if you, uh, if you need any information. Thanks.